For the last uh, three Sundays leading in today, our fourth Sunday of the sermon series, we've been uh, looking at kingdom treasure. And all of our sermons on kingdom treasure have come from the same chapter in the Gospel according to Matthew. It's chapter 6, where Jesus is giving us lessons like the first week, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then we had, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Last week, you cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And each Sunday that we've been talking about stewardship and looking at Matthew chapter 6 and Jesus' words about the kingdom of God and our own treasure, our own hearts, We've uh, had a video to celebrate a, a testimony from a family about stewardship. This morning, our video is just a little bit longer. It's our celebration video. We wanted to give you a chance to see the many wonderful ways in which we are trying to help Christ build his kingdom and where we are going in the future. Would you please turn your attention to the celebration video? Hi, this is Pete King, and I will have the great privilege to uh, fill the role of the lay leader for Perdido Bay United Methodist Church coming up in 2018. As such, I wanted to introduce you to some people that are just like you and just like me, friends of our church, members of our community, who have been affected by the great missions and ministries that go on here in our wonderful, vibrant church. You'll also hear some stories from those folks who have found giving to be an essential part of their Christian walk. And so I'll let them speak for themselves. The church, as many of you know, started really, we, had, we used the chapel of a funeral home that was down where a furniture store is now. And the first, um, church council meeting was held in our living room. So we go way, way back. Uh, we're well aware of what it takes to promote a church, both financially and spiritually, and to grow into the community like this church has. I think sometimes we fail to realize what it means to one, uh, each of us in that we're so busy doing things but when we sit down and take time to reflect on that, it's very, very assuring to know uh, that what we do is helping everybody and it's what God wants us to do. I feel that my uh, volunteer hours are, are more a blessing to me than they are to anybody else. Um, the, now I am gonna cry. <laughs> The, the Redemption Store volunteer team is just an amazing group of people. Uh, and I have met people, made friends there, uh, had experiences there that uh, have vastly enriched my life. You know, we are so blessed, we have to give back. I love coming here and seeing what I can find from my 93-year-old mom. And, um, and then I like to shop for other people that have needs and don't have much. The Redemption Store is kind of a very special place where Christ lives through us. And we do it because we have wonderful customers who come in here. Sometimes they want us to help them with their shopping. Sometimes they just want us to be their friends. And we so enjoy that. We're a military family. This is actually the first church that we ever visited and we instantly felt connected and joined shortly thereafter. For us, giving or consistent giving is a form of worship and whatever stage we're at in our faith life or our faith journey, we're all here on some level to worship and that worship is you know, meant to change us, to strengthen us, to help us align our lives more with that of uh, the life that Jesus has laid out for us. And um, we. Neither of us really grew up in super active church families as young kids, so it's really important for us to um, have that environment for our kids growing up. The most I can say is that thank you. It's generosity, it's love, it's caring, it's taking care of a lot of people. Um, excuse me for getting upset, but uh, about 16 years ago, I was shot doing my job for this country, and now I'm 
here I'm in a wheelchair um, it's hard and I can't thank you enough for all your blessings it's life-saving I have a lot of gratitude for everybody who has helped me so being part of PBUMC um, benefits our family I think first and foremost with all the relationships um, we've made socially and um, deeper relationships but mostly we've met tons of great people in this community over the years. Um, I like all the youth programs and child programs that we get to go to because we get to have fun with all of our friends while also learning about Jesus. I think that it also benefits our health because we figured out about transformance and um, it helps our work ethic and um, just makes us feel really good. I'd say why that we give is um, to this to this organization is one we our family benefits from it, which we, we talked about, but also we can see we can see where our dollars go. We can see um, outreach to the community. Years ago, when we joined, and you sort of repeat the line, "Give of your your times and talents." You don't really. Um, think about how exactly that's going to pertain to you and then then you sit in church one Sunday and uh, Night to Shine comes about and somehow I jumped in with two feet and so I think it's been a blessing to us. Is the more we've gotten involved and the more our children have gotten involved, the more comfortable we've felt with giving financially and the more um, secure we have felt in where our financial dollars are going. I've had the privilege of being a volunteer at the Night to Shine dance for the past two years as a photographer for the event. I also have the unique position of being the parent of a special needs child. My favorite memory from the Night to Shine dance is probably um, riding in the limos because that's something I've wanted to do my whole life and now I've been able to do it twice which is pretty awesome. My favorite part is the night dancing. It's very fun and really easy. I have a good experience from here because this is my uh, home, my hair. Thank you, P U M C, for, for the Night Zoo Sign every year. The Night Zoo Sign is incredible. Feel welcome. Just have fun and things you be off. One of the neat things that I loved seeing as I was moving around the floor taking pictures at the dance was to look up at the windows in the gym and see all the parents' faces smiling down. You know, it's, it means so much to them to be able to see their children truly having a wonderful time. I would like to tell them thank you and I'm really looking forward to the next one. I love my church. I'm Daphne Whitley. We're here at Global Learning Academy where Perdido Bay has a ministry called BOB, which stands for Battle of the Books. What we do is we provide um, classroom sets of 15 books to the school, and then the third, fourth, and fifth grade classes read those books, and every other week, um, volunteers come in and have a book club with the kids. This program is so great and wonderful. Our kids get really excited when the volunteers come to read. They just love them and they treasure when they come in and every day they ask, when are our Bob people coming? Bob has just been such a wonderful program and we are so blessed to have this at our school. All the mentors that I've had have been very close to me and I really love them and also I've opened up a lot more having them there and when I came home the, um, the first day of third grade that they came I told my mom so much about it even though she probably was like oh you're rambling too much so yeah it has it will always and forever have an important part in my heart and I can't thank Miss Daphne and all the other volunteers enough. I think that um, community is incredibly important to our church um, and I think that community extends outside the walls of our church and outside of our zip code. Inspiring and uplifting but there's more that you should know. You should know that the church staff and the leadership here have a great sense of responsibility to the gift and to the giver, a sense of stewardship. And if you look around, you can see evidence of that all throughout our church campus. 
you can find a youth room where our young people gather for fellowship and to be nurtured. Even parking for 500 worshipers on a Sunday. Two places to worship, Sunday school rooms, a staff that administers all of God's work, two wonderful pastors that lead us through God's kingdom and all that he would have for us, and ministries and missions that go as far as Africa or as close as Aquaporta. And so I want you to know that the gifts that you give are well managed and you can help in that regard too. This is a pledge card that we'll be filling out during this uh, Pledge Sunday. Of course, you can fill it out now and turn it at any time at the church office. And you should know this may be the most important tool that our finance committee and that our church leadership has in managing and planning what goes on at Perdido Bay United Methodist Church and how we fit into God's work. And so I ask you to cheerfully and prayerfully consider all of what we've seen before us today and that you would uh, send your pledge card in so that we can plan for the future of Perdido Bay United Methodist Church. Thank you. This is the morning where we ask those who are committed to our church, who are a part of the body of Christ here, to do as Pete was just talking about. And if you didn't bring uh, your pledge card with you this morning, we do have them available in the back. And if you're visiting with us and don't have one, we certainly understand. It's just part of the life of what it means to not only be a Christian, but to be a part of a church that we plan for a Sunday like this, and we hope all feel uh, welcomed here this morning. My name is uh, David, and I'm one of the pastors uh, with Levi. I join in welcoming you, and this morning as we continue to look at Christ's word to us from Matthew chapter 6, I would invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I, uh, several years ago, was uh, called by God to start my ministry in uh, youth ministry. I have a lot of respect for youth ministers like Dudley over here. I just praise God that right now I'm not being called into youth ministry full time because there was an element of it all that uh, I just couldn't really get past, and I was I, I was really glad to be done with, and that was uh, the smell of teenage boys on retreats. It is the worst part of the youth ministry job that there could possibly be, and something happens when they leave their mamas in seventh and eighth grade. They decide they don't have to brush their teeth or bathe themselves. I don't know what it is, and and, and so we give them talks about, you know, you got to take care. There's some hygiene that's needed. There was this one kid. His name was Chad. He smelled so badly. Um, I felt really sorry for him. And so I called him into the room, and I sat him over there, and I stood back here. <laughs> and I said, Chad, sit down. I need to talk to you about something. Um, you smell gross. And uh, he just kind of looked at me, you know, like, what are you talking about? I don't smell that. And I said, Chad, I know this isn't important to you right now, but uh, one day very soon, you're going to want girls, you know, to pay attention to you. And you're going to want to be huggable or at least tolerable. So my suggestion is, you know, go brush your teeth, take a bath, and spray on some deodorant. 
He looked at me like he'd never heard of these things, you know, toothpaste. What are you talking about? And I said, Chad, really, seriously, man, it's, it's getting, it's, you, you're probably going to get a disease if you continue to live this way. And we were just two days into the retreat. And he looked at me, and this was before cell phones and, uh, and, and eighth graders having them in their hands with Google. He said, I had to write the word down. Well, David, I have a blutophobia. That's what he said. He didn't tell me what it meant. I thought it meant stinky boy disease. He said, I have a blutophobia, which is true. It is the fear of taking a bath anywhere that isn't your own shower. I don't believe Chad really had this. I think he just put it in his back pocket because the year before I had complained about him not taking a bath. And he wanted to be armed and ready when I came at him with arm and hammer. And so uh, anyway, I, I was looking up some of these other crazy uh, fears. Have you? Do you know there's, there's hundreds of them in the American psychology? Psychologist journal. One of them is somnophobia. This is the abnormal fear of falling asleep. My son Joseph has this one. That's why it was important to me. Then there's also a strange one called half a phobia. I have to read them from my page because who can remember these words? Half a phobia is the fear of being touched. I have this on youth retreats. Uh, there is oikophobia. This is the fear of household appliances. I'm ready to tell Elizabeth that I have oikophobia. Uh, there is chlorophobia, which is the irrational fear of clowns. There is a member of our church staff that is a chlorophobic. They may not know it, but that's what it's called. There is decidophobia, the abnormal fear of having to make a decision. There is jephrophobia. Now listen to this one. Jephrophobia is the fear of driving your car over a bridge, and in two major U.S. cities, there are companies that have capitalized on jephrophobics. You pay this guy some money, he sits in your car, he drives you over the bridge while you cower in the back seat, and then on the way home, he does the same thing all over again for you. That is amazing to me. There is, uh, oh, this one's good. If I asked you if you have an Innie or an Audi, do you know what I'm talking about? I speak from the wire, you know, an Audi, not the car, but an Audi. Yeah, if I asked you that and you suddenly were afraid of the question, you have omlophobia, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, it's the fear of belly buttons or talking about belly buttons. <laughs> and then there is phobophobia which is the fear of phobias. I mean, that really was in the American Psychologist Journal. There really is something that's plaguing uh, the American society in the 21st century, I, I believe. It's an epidemic. Because if you look at the definition of epidemic, it's really just any disease that in a given human population over a given amount of time extraordinarily exceeds expectations. And I think that the epidemic we're suffering with today is worry. Seems like everyone I talk to is worried every day about something or someone or, or some matter. 50 million Americans have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders, and that says nothing about the millions more who are just stressed out to the max. We are in the age of anxiety and of worry. And a lot of times, our worry is over family, finances, time, energy, future, how all these overlap and intersect. But as long as people have been worrying, there have also been this great group of people writing songs telling us not to worry and comforting us in our worry, like uh, Bob Marley's Three Little Birds. That's what I named the sermon this morning, Don't Worry About a Thing. Or Bobby McFerrin's, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Or the Beach Boys, Don't Worry, Baby. Yeah, they, these are songs that bring some comfort. Just listening to music can alleviate some of our worries. I know this is true because I see it in my kids. Uh, Joseph and Grace, when they get a little anxious at night, we'll sing them a song. Not very well. I can't sing well, but it just it works somehow. And uh, when we strap them into the car and they start to feel confined, we'll turn on the little music CD and it begins to soothe grace, usually. Um, it works. When Joseph was one and a half, I learned this trick that if I bought, brought him up to the church and someone was playing a band instrument, it just he just would be still. I mean, for about 10 minutes, which was a huge success for me. I mean, he would sit there and watch the instrument and listen uh, to the kids play. It was, it was amazing. But before Marley and McFerrin, there was Jesus who wrote his Do Not Worry song. And that's what we just read. It's the one piece 
of all of this in Matthew 6 that it, it really does change to this poetic uh, verse. Jesus collected people together up on a hill and he sat down and he gave us his do not worry song. He, he began uh, with these words, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? And then he harmoniously spoke of birds and lilies and how God cares for them and values them. He, he is trying to speak to the human heart, not just our heart, every human heart, through these powerful words in the Sermon on the Mount. And he knows that part of all of our hearts includes our worries, our struggles. And he wants to speak to that some truth to that. Because he knows that worrying about all these things turns to a fear that robs us of the peace and joy God wants for us in our lives. Do not let worry rob you of the peace and joy God has in store for you. So his Do Not Worry song has several points. It begins with uh, a very important question about what is it that God treasures? I like this, uh, the way that, that he begins it, because uh, it's a very interesting thing. If you think about what does God treasure, you would think, well, gosh, that should be one of the most important pieces of uh, the Christian gospel, is to understand what does God value most. I mean, you would think any disciple would want to know, what is it that God treasures he talks about birds and lilies, and he says, but you, you are who God values. You are God's treasure. You are God's treasure. You know, our treasure is measured in this world by time and energy and money. God spends all of his time, all of his energy, all of his resources on you and your salvation. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of the Bible, God is showing us that he is pouring himself into us and our salvation. You are God's treasure. And understanding that you are God's treasure is the beginning of understanding good stewardship. And it's the beginning of understanding a path to worrying so much less. So Jesus continues. And he asks this question, who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? You know what happens, what adds to your life when you worry is just uh, stress and uh, burden, and it actually deteriorates. This is not just theology, this is science. Worrying takes away from the physical body, the emotional self, the physical and spiritual self. That, that Worrying breaks down instead of builds up. And so what is it that we can do? Well, we can seek first God's kingdom. That's Jesus' solution. Don't seek after this money that is spoiling your life. Don't try to build your own kingdom. Seek after God's kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will fall into place. It's the healing of greed, which is at work in all of our human lives, trying to rob us of peace. Christ is telling us to invest ourselves in God. So he asks these questions that we are always asking ourselves. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? And he's saying, take all that energy, take all those questions, and instead ask this question, what can I do for the kingdom of God today? Instead of waking up and wondering about the self, what is the kingdom of God like? And how can I be a part of the kingdom of God? How can I seek first God's righteousness this day, this moment? Because if we do that, if we can make that where our thoughts go, then our passions will be redirected off of fear and anxiety and into the peace and the hope that Christ has for us as we partner with him in building his kingdom. I think the surest and safest investment that any of us can make is giving our first fruits back to God because it's the investment that Christ has called us to make to place ourselves first in God's kingdom, to seek first God's kingdom. So this morning when you come forward with one of these commitment cards and 
place them in the basket. You're taking a stand with God that you're going to do something different in this world. You're going to live for God and not just for self. You're taking a stand for Christ and his kingdom. But you're also taking a stand with God for yourself. It's a statement that you want to have more peace in your life. That you want to offer yourself first and foremost to God. So that you can have less worry and less stress. Because surely our God in heaven will care for those who place their hearts in his kingdom. Now, does this mean that if I turn in a pledge card, I won't have any bad things happen to me and I never have to work again? Of course not. (laughs) That's not what it means when it says God will take care of us. What it means is that when those struggles happen, which will happen in everyone's life, whether they keep everything for themselves or not, is that our hearts will be situated already in God's kingdom, in God's company of peace and life. You see, even if bad things may come in my life or of my life, I will know if I've made this commitment to Christ that my life will first and foremost be about doing good in this world for Jesus Christ. That I and my family, we will be giving to be one piece of the big puzzle that is the body of Christ at work in this world, feeding and clothing and caring for people in Christ's holy name. I want my life to have purpose in this world. And purpose comes from being a part of the building of Christ's kingdom. So my first fruits, my first investment is as Christ has called me to give, it is in God's kingdom. I want my heart to be there so that whatever I may face in life, I have the resources of the kingdom of God because I've invested myself in the kingdom of God. And today we're uh, taking part in this Celebration Sunday. I've loved this sermon series, Kingdom Treasure, because each week we've we've talked about and celebrated all the wonderful things that we are able to do as good stewards in this world. And you saw in the video so many wonderful things that we are doing and we will continue to do. And I know that every dollar I put forth, and we've talked about this. I'm not going to break it down for you again, but if you need to hear how we spend our money, let me know. I'll tell you, but I know it's going to worship. It's going to Christian service, it's going to fellowship, and it's going to discipleship growth, not just for me, but for children and adults. That's what I want my life to be about. As Levi said last week, I'll I'll keep the other 90%, and God's given me blessing to do with it as I will, but I want that first fruit to be going towards God's kingdom, to be going towards the things that will last and are eternal in the heavens, I want less worry and stress. I want to put myself in God's holy hands. People have asked me as a clergy person, I guess, I think they're genuinely interested. You know, how do I fill out my pledge card? What do I um, tithe? And so uh, this is what I tell folks, and I'm I'm happy to tell you a few nights ago, we've been meaning to do it for weeks, but it was the night after Halloween. Elizabeth and I sat down with our pledge card and uh, we wrote down what we knew we would receive in 2018 as income. We did the best estimate uh, of our income and our housing allowance here from the church. And what we do is we write down on the card 10% before taxes of everything that we're going to take in. Now, Not everybody relates to God that way, and the relationship we have with God is intimate, and I understand that, but that's how we determine our commitment to Christ, because it's how we want to respond to the fact that God's amazing grace and extravagant generosity has shown up in our lives and made a place in our home, that God teaches us and instructs us and sends us out as a response to his grace and his goodness. We want to respond in this way. Another person who had this same experience was Matt Green. He used to sit over here and play on stage with the band. We read his name just a few minutes ago because in the last year, he's one of our church members who's passed away. Matt uh, died too soon. And uh, kind of tragically, in the hospital, Levi and I both were able to be with Diane and his family when he passed away. And uh, uh, two months ago, his wife called me and said that she wanted to share something with me about Mac that I may not know. 
She said that several years before I met him, uh, he retired. He worked really hard to retire early in life. He retired and he wanted to move to Perdido and he had all these ideas in store for how he was going to live his life and all the great things he was going to do. And uh, then he got a really bad back problem so severe that he had to have multiple surgeries on it, and he really started to get very down and, and depressed because all the things that he had wanted to do and all the things he thought would bring him great happiness, he now was no longer able to do. And she said that then he started showing up to band and got involved a little bit of a time and then became more involved and started putting his time and his energy into this worship service and into this place, inviting people, encouraging people to help and to participate. He started giving some of their money to this church and to the worship service and the ministries of the church. And she said in his last few years of life, he had more joy than he had ever had in his life before. He found so much joy in life, Diane told me, in being a part of this band this worship service, this church. So he left some gifts for us as, as he went from this world onto the next. But the greatest gift is his witness. That real peace and joy can be found in making an investment in God's kingdom. As I reflect on All Saints Sunday and I think about eternity, where I'm headed, I think about faith that saves me and a faith that strengthens and sustains me for each day, a faith that teaches me not to worry. I sometimes wonder if my faith is as deep and as wide as it needs to be. You may be asking those same questions. You may feel emptiness somewhere in your heart. God has spoken to our heart. And he says, trust. Trust in me and my commands. If you want to make a step that will strengthen your faith, try trust and obedience. Because where Christ is leading us is where we all want to be, need to be, are called to be. It's hard not to worry. And this world will let you down. But God will not. You are God's treasure. The question is, do you treasure him? Do you treasure his kingdom? Do you believe he can care for you and create for you blessings you cannot create for yourself? That great is God's faithfulness. And what Christ has said is place your treasure in the kingdom of God. Place your time, your energy, your money in the kingdom of God and your heart will follow. There's no greater place for your heart to be than in God's kingdom. And your heart will always follow your treasure. Right after he tells us you cannot serve money and God, he says, do not worry. And he says it over and over and over again. Do not worry. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. We have the holy privilege placing the first of ourselves into the kingdom of God, of making this commitment to trust him and his care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.